Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to our talk. So when a botnet cries, detecting botnet infection chains. And uh, honestly, we also cried a little bit as well, because it was not uh, as easy as we thought it would be initially, um, but still very interesting research. So let's walk you through our little uh, journey with botnets and uh, their infection chains. I am uh, Erwan, and uh, this is uh, Guillaume. Hi, everyone. We are both working at uh, Sequoia.io in the threat and detection research team. Uh, our, overall, our team's daily mission is uh, detection engineering and tracking attackers through their uh, infrastructure and malware. And uh, yet, we, Guillaume and I are more focused on the uh, detection uh, engineering part. So this is the main topic, obviously, of this uh, presentation. This is our agenda for the next 35 to 40 minutes. Um, first of all, we will present a bit of context uh, around the botnets we show to, to study and their infection chains and what is it. We will um, explain and present existing public Sigma rules uh, allowing to detect these botnets. Then we will move on to uh, Sigma correlation which is a little bit less known than uh, just Sigma. And uh, we will present uh, two rules we have uh, wrote to detect botnets. And finally, we will um, explain how we do the integration with our CTI uh, at scale. So why focusing on botnet infection chains and which botnets, which infection chains? So the third choice uh, of botnet using some interesting infection chain is Quackbot, also known as uh, Qbot. So it was initially a banking trojan that evolved in uh, modular uh, malware, and it's been around since uh, 2008. It's a very popular one among uh, threat actors, particularly around, uh, among initial access brokers. And uh, their customers, we have listed some of them on the left, um, are either in the uh, theft or the ransomware business. And um, thanks to Prodaft uh, providing some, uh, some um, figures around the, for the victims, we can see it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really impacting uh, over the last, uh, last year. And the, the malware is, used, is dropped either by other malware or uh, some phishing uh, techniques as we will see, and, and is used, it is used uh, more um, as a loader than as a banking trojant. And as you can see, is used dropping, uh, they are dropping um, common rat or ransomware later on. The second choice was uh, Iced ID, and it's quite similar to, uh, to Quackbot, in fact. So it's as well a banking trojant that evolved into just a loader, and uh, it's been around since 2017. And um, again, a list of uh, threat actors using it, and using it as well as a loader. Uh, I think Proofpoint has a recent report regarding that, uh, mentioning that they have even new some they have new samples now uh, containing only the loader part uh, of the of the malware without the banking trojan part. And again, uh, quite a lot of victims uh, observed uh, by Prodaft regarding the, uh, this, uh, this malware. So both Quackbot and ISD are really uh, impact teams in terms of victims, and uh, they are quite similar in terms of features. But obviously there's something else that was uh, interesting for us to study, and I'll let Guillaume uh, just explain that. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'll talk to you about uh, their infection chains because uh, they are really common, uh, which, which is also why we chose uh, these two uh, malware. Um, so first of all, what's an infection chain just for the sake of this presentation? So we just agree on a rough definition. So uh, it will be like from the phishing email with a benign file to the actual malicious payload execution, quite classic. Uh, so 
you can see here that it's kind of a jungle out there. Uh, there's lots of different infection chains. Uh, on the graphs, uh, you can see that, uh, if that works, yeah. Uh, there's like, we kind of categorized them in four uh, inf different point, entry point of infection chains. So URL, HTML, PDF, zip. And then uh, you can see that at the end of all infection chains, there's a DLL block. So uh, we're wondering how could we detect those infection chains. And the first thing that comes to mind would be uh, the DLL execution or DLL loading. DLL, yeah, overall the, the TTP around that. Uh, however, on a defender point of view, it's kind of hard to perform. Uh, to have detection rules that are really efficient without false positives for uh, the world DLL execution, DLL loading, uh, TTP. Uh, so uh, we're wondering how could we still detect most of these infection chains, uh, but uh, having a different approach. So uh, this is why you see some colored blocks uh, in these graph trees. Uh, we emphasize the main infection chains. Um, yeah, the pointer works on both slides, that's good. Uh, so, um, so for instance, the ISO LNK, which is well known, it's not only ISO, but uh, most of uh, in my image uh, archives. Um, you can see also HTML smuggling like infection chains in yellow, uh, just zip LNK and stuff like that. So. We found out, just looking at this, that it's quite interesting to focus our detection on that. And uh, obviously, this is used by Quackbot and IceID, but it's also used by many different actors. So uh, that's kind of a good thing for us defenders. And uh, therefore, we transposed those graph trees into like a timeline to see if we could, uh, if it's still worth. Uh, doing detection on that. And um, as you can see, um, the main thing to, to remember on that timeline would be that even though old, uh, yeah, all the infection chain, root infection chain techniques uh, are used, uh, they tend to stay over time. And uh, so, for instance, ISO-LNK is still there today, uh, but HTML smuggling is also there for a while now. Uh, macros is a bit specific, uh, obviously, since uh, Microsoft did some, uh, some actions on that. And uh, so, new one still emerged. Uh, that's kind of the issue, <laughs> and uh, which is uh, a hard part for defenders, obviously, but that's the game. Um, and so, we, this is why uh, we focused on our detection on these root infection chains, kind of. And uh, this is like the main topic of uh, our presentation. Um, so first of all, before talking about detection, uh, we wanted to show you uh, like a classic infection chain by Quackbot, uh, in case you haven't seen one yet. If, yeah. Cool. Uh, so uh, it's classic. That's a phishing email with an HTML at attachment. Uh, the user download the HTML file, then uh, it says like wrong format kind of stuff. Uh, you have a password to extract your archive, and then uh, basically uh, you double click on the uh, folder, the ISO file, and then you double click again and again. It's, yeah, uh, until uh, it actually loads uh, the malware. And so, as you can see there, there's many, many user steps. And uh, it still works. Um, and uh, the goal for us defenders would be to uh, uh, actually detect those user steps, kind of and not really what the malware will do uh, once it's loaded. And so this is what we will uh, focus on on the next part. Yeah, so 
before explaining some uh, rules, a quick uh, explanation around the um, detection workflow. Um, and just to explain um, uh, some prerequisites for us to, to build uh, effective detection rules and uh, some, <coughs> some uh, strategic choices we, we've made. So <coughs> our context on work context is we have uh, various customers sending logs from different sources. And obviously these logs are passed and we do some normalization using uh, elastic common schema. And then it will proceed and go to the uh, detection engines. Um, and we will talk today about the sigma one and the sigma correlation one. And what is very important here for us um, is the uh, normalization part. Because um, so our customers are quite heterogeneous when it comes to, to logs. And uh, they will send us logs from cloud application, from network, from the host, etc. So uh, in various formats, some of them use uh, EDR, some of them are just log collectors from Windows. So we want to build uh, the same rule for all of these uh, various formats. And that's where um, <clears throat> when you want to, to use uh, Sigma or other detection language, uh, from a point of view, it's very important to have the normalization for the field name and sometimes for the values as well. And uh, this is a very key point um, uh, to, to use effective rule and to avoid what's very important for detection engineers, it's uh, the, to, 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 to reach the right balance between uh, false positives and uh, coverage, obviously. So now <clears throat> let's check the two public sigma rules, uh, so in their original format, and then we'll talk about our rules. And the first rule we want to, to present here is kind of an extreme example. This is a suspicious scheduled task name as Giadi. And um, this is not specific to QuackBot, but uh, it detected QuackBot, and it was made following a, a DeFire report um, in 2021, yeah. And, um, in that attack, uh, so it was QuackBot, um, QuackBot using zero, log zero logon back in the days, and in that attack they used a scheduled task with a gear ID as a task name, as you can see on the screenshot below. So let's check what the rule actually uh, detects. So this is the, the Sigma rule. Uh, for those who are not familiar, so you have, uh, we're just show, showing here the detection part where you have uh, multiple selections, and the condition is that you need to, to, to reach all these uh, selections. And the first one is the, um, we are looking for the image name that needs to end with uh, schtask.exe. Then the command line needs to have the, arg the argument slash create. And uh, another argument in the command line is the slash tn for the task name with um, uh, some variation around uh, quotes, double quotes, and curly brackets, and the same for the end of the, uh, the last part of the name. And uh, the rule works well, very well, uh, as at a period of time, of course, and obviously a, a few months later or a few weeks later, it is bypassed by another sample. So to sum up a little bit uh, <clears throat> what we've just seen, we'll uh, try to to, um, to see the pros and cons of, uh, of the rule with, uh, with some constraints we want to check and we put that uh, on the, onto the radar. So on the radar, the, the smaller is, a, is a better here and the, uh, the first constraint is the, uh, the, uh, the data source, the raw data source. So here you have this, just in the, the rule is quite simple. It just uses a, the name of the, uh, the process and the command line. So it's quite common, easy to have to in various logs uh, sources. And um, same thing for the test, the time of uh, testing, when you want to test the rule before putting it in production, it's very easy to, to test the scheduled task uh, creation. So very good, uh, very good score here. And the false positive rate as well is very important, obviously, and it's again very low in our telemetry, at least, we didn't see any false positive, uh, never. So <clears throat> um, the rule is very specific. 
that's obvious because it's uh, based on the specific format of the task name. And this is related to last point because it makes it hard to maintain uh, if you want to, uh, to keep it uh, effective over time and you want to cover probably other format like the, than the uh, GUID name. But at the end, the rule is good, but a bit far from uh, what we were looking for, uh, detecting the root infection chain. So let's study another one, uh, much closer to what we want, and this is the one not infection chain. Yeah, so uh, while the previous one was kind of, as everyone said, a silly, like, extreme example to make a point, uh, this one uh, will be much more focused on uh, detecting an actual infection chain. Uh, as you may be aware, one not infection chains um, have been on a rise uh, since uh, earlier this year, I think, since January probably. Uh, something like that, um, and uh, where this is kind of a classic uh, infection chain used by uh, Quackbot, I think. Uh, yeah, we forgot to thanks Proxy Life before, but uh, his work may helped us a lot to uh, to build this presentation uh, and uh, to help us in our research. And so, a uh, classic infection chain uh, with one knot will be uh, just. You, the user is receiving a OneNote file as an attachment, then uh, it doubles click on the OneNote file, then uh, in that file there's another file that is embedded, it double click on that file as well, and uh, it loads uh, different commands in the end. So the rule we wanted to show you, which is also a public Sigma rule, uh, is uh, called suspicious Microsoft OneNote child process. So it detects exactly what the title says, uh, suspicious Microsoft one child processes. Um, but also some other stuff like suspicious command line extens file extensions and suspicious uh, file paths like uh, suspicious directories. Uh, do not want to uh, spend much time on showing you the rule, but basically uh, it does detect the previous infection chain I just showed you. And uh, it kind of still works today from what we've observed. And uh, it's kind of a great rule. Uh, if we take our radar again, uh, so the data sources used by the rule is, are quite simple. It's just parent-child processes relationships uh, and command lines, so basically most of the uh, solutions have that. Uh, then the time and skills required for this rule is maybe a bit higher uh, yeah, for than uh, the suspicious schedule task, but it's still quite easy to build this such rule. Uh, you just probably need one nut, uh, but that's kind of easy. Uh, then uh, on the first positive thing, we only observed like one or two first positives in like 30 days time range on our telemetry, so it's quite nice as well. However, uh, it's still a really specific rule, obviously, uh, but still much broader than the uh, scheduled task name since uh, in this case, you do detect most of the one not infection chains. However, as you saw, on the previous slide, you have several file extensions. Uh, so you have different lists, so list of suspicious processes, list of file extensions, list of suspicious directories. So it can obviously be bypassed probably, uh, yeah, easily, but by some actors, but most of uh, like the infection chains used by Quackbot and ICID kind of always use the, the same stuff. So in case you don't have like a suspicious process or a suspicious file extension, you just have to update your rule, which is kind of lead us to our next point. Is it hard to maintain or not? Not really, uh, since you do know that it's the only rule, uh, kind probably the only rule you have for one not infection chain. So uh, you can test and test again different one not infection chain. And if it doesn't trigger your rule, you just kind of update it. Um, so uh, we think the rule is quite nice. 
uh, on, uh, it's quite efficient and it doesn't require much time to be built. Uh, however, uh, it's kind of only possible because of how one works. Since uh, it embeds a file, then uh, it kind of triggers the fact that uh, there's a one not parent process followed by a, a child process that can be suspicious. Uh, that's not always the case for uh, the over infection chains, which leads us to our next part and uh, introducing, introducing you to uh, correlation rules. So correlation is probably well known by now. Um, most of the solutions have uh, correlation-based uh, detection capabilities. Uh, however, maybe sigma correlation is a bit less well known. Uh, it's quite recent. I think it's like it has only a year old. Uh, and so we wanted to show you just a, a dumb rule to uh, kind of show you how a correlation sigma rule looks like. At least it's not really, it's always uh, based on our detection engine. So you have uh, elastic common schema fields. However, it's kind of the same uh, thing as the classic uh, sigma rules that you will find publicly. And so, in this case, you just have a simple rule that detects a Q user command, a command line starting with Q user, then a second rule that detects a command line starting with dir, and then the correlation part is just correlating uh, temporarily uh, those two so classic sigma rules, and if you see those two sigma rules, uh, the first one followed by the second one in one minute on the same host name by the same username, uh, it will uh, just uh, trigger an alert. So just to show you how cor correlation rule looks like, and then we therefore uh, wanted to show you how we applied uh, correlation to uh, trying to detect uh, infection chains. And so uh, we wanted to focus on first on the uh, ISOLNK infection chain. So in this slide, uh, you can see that uh, there are several parts on the slide. Uh, the first part would be that it starts from the bottom to, to the top. So you have an ISO file that's been created uh, by, by WinRAR in this case. And then you have a suspicious process uh, not really suspicious process, a W script process that's been launched, and then it triggered an alert. If we dig deeper in that uh, uh, W script process, you can see that it's been launched by explorer.exe, and uh, that's, it launches a JavaScript file in the end. So uh, we wanted to show you how uh, such kind of alert can be triggered. And uh, we made a correlation rule for ISO LNK that can be, we think, useful for everyone. And uh, all the correlation rules we'll present um, today uh, are publicly available in our GitHub repository. So you maybe have to adapt a few things to your environment, but globally, you can use them. And uh, so we didn't want to show you the, the rule. Uh, because it's quite hard to explain and to look at. Uh, so we made uh, some graphs for that. Uh, so what is this commemoration rule about? So you have an image file creation first, which uh, is kind of also a list of uh, file extensions that are related to image files. So ISO, VHD, IMG and stuff like that. And then you have a second rule that uh, spots uh, suspicious uh, child processes coming from explorer.exe. So it's a list of more than 60 processes, uh, which is why it's not all listed here. And uh, why we do this is because when you have a classic ISO LNK uh, infection chain in the end, uh, as you saw in the video, uh, the user just double clicks, double clicks, double clicks. So it's kind of always explorer that's uh, the parent of the, the processes. And uh, so this is why uh, the rule is built like this. It's also to avoid false positives, obviously. And uh, so the first sub rule followed by the, so the green rule followed by the blue rule uh, within five minutes on the same host name will trigger an alert. And uh, this is the alert you just showed before. And uh, 
So on our environment, uh, this rule is quite nice and doesn't trigger lots of, uh, like, not any false positives and uh, does detect uh, still uh, infection chain uh, today that uses uh, ISO and NK. So that's one of the two correlation rules we wanted to talk to you about. The next one, the uh, one we talked to you about is uh, HTML smuggling. Yes, and again, this is an alert raised uh, by the HTML smuggling rule we built. And <clears throat> from the bottom, you, as you can see, um, this is, there is an uh, HTML file created by um, Firefox. And um, if we go up, we can see that uh, Firefox is then creating a zip file. And then we have command windows, command that launch, uh, xcopy.exe, cmd.exe. So this is really the infection chain we've shown you in this video the HTML smuggling. And <clears throat> this is the, the correlation rule, so it's a bit com more complex. Um, it's simple, simple, so on the schema we have um, in the, the blue, uh, yeah, the blue one, the first uh, temporal rule, in the, the, green, the green one, the value count rule, and globally uh, a temporal, temporal rule uh, grouping the bus together. So we'll explain the, the first one um, uh, is composed of three uh, sub rules. So we want to detect the HTML file creation uh, followed by a um, um, browser process opening a local HTML file. So it's quite, quite specific. And then uh, some suspicious file creation. So here it was, a, it was a zip file, but it could be yeah, a bad file. Uh, we've seen several uh, different variations around uh, the infection chain used by QuackBot and SDID. And then the second, uh, the second uh, rule in green um, is the value count rule, where we want to monitor some suspicious processes, or it's, uh, it's more of the Windows command processes uh, used by attackers. So we have a large, uh, long list, like uh, uh, Guillaume said before, of uh, more than 60, and we want to do a count of value on that, uh, on that uh, around the process command line related to these processes, and we want uh, three or more than three uh, value of that. Within two minutes, group by host name on the same uh, user, uh, group by host name by the same username. And this one and uh, the previous one followed by this one, uh, on the two minute, two minute period of time on the same host name with the same username, uh, will produce, will uh, raise an alert. And globally, uh, this rule was tested very recently. We, we experienced, experienced it uh, for uh, from a couple of months. And uh, it's, it's quite nice. We have a, a quite low rate of false positives um, that are really related to um, specific customer environment where uh, some uh, a classic uh, local software or administrator actions could uh, could trigger the rule, but it's it's remained quite low and quite easy to filter. So let's sum up for the both of these two rules we have, we've uh, we've sum up uh, here in the same radar again, and um, and uh, as you can see here we for the uh, the data source we it's a bit more. Um, more complex, so it's a, it's a, we have a, a lot of fields, uh, different fields, and one specific, uh, which is a bit more rare, it's the file name. It's not always available in every uh, log sources. And the testing as well, and uh, the time on testing in, uh, in lab is a little bit more complex. And um, the false positive rate, I've just mentioned it, it's quite, uh, it's quite low. The rule for us, not so much specific because we were able to uh, to follow and test uh, a new infection chain used by uh, uh, by Quackbot and SD uh, using HTML smuggling, and every time it seems to work. So quite uh, quite nice. And the maintenance of the rule, uh, this is quite similar to uh, uh, what uh, Guillaume mentioned for the one not one because we have a list of uh, of processes, a list of file extensions. So it's quite easy to to, to update. So to conclude a little bit on the different rules we've presented, um, so on the radar again, we have put all uh, three together. There was the scheduled task rule in, uh, 
In gray, the, in purple, the, uh, the one not, and in blue, the, the correlation ones. And still, the, as you can see, the, the one not is really, really good compared to, uh, to, to the other, even to the, uh, to the correlation rules. Um, but uh, uh, we know that it will probably not last very long again because uh, Microsoft has made some announcement around the uh, security measure uh, to protect one not against this kind of um, abuse. Um, <clears throat> and the, the correlation at the end is, is quite well balanced between uh, uh, in terms of efficiency versus complexity and false positives. So is that enough? Um, uh, in our correlation detection, we didn't talk about uh, the network, for instance, and uh, <laughs> there was a reason for that, but I will not detail here uh, that. And uh, we wanted also to um, to explain how we will uh, how we integrate these uh, these rules, these correlation rules, in our CTI workflow. And uh, Guillaume will will do the last part explaining that. Yeah. So we'll conclude by uh, doing this part. So. Uh, a few words, uh, so uh, lots of you here are probably tracking uh, different threat actors. It's kind of the same for Quackbot, ISTID, and stuff like that. It's yeah. kind of easy-ish to, to follow. Uh, you have uh, an example here that uh, is uh, good to follow Quackbot uh, when they are using uh, like default certificates. Uh, when we say default certificate, it's uh, kind of just always the same pattern in the certificate, not always the same certificate itself. Uh, uh, on the right, uh, you can see that there's different uh, points, uh, six points that are uh, useful to uh, make uh, like regexes on census or a different search engine like that to uh, find uh, Quackbot uh, C2s. And uh, you can see that we have results on that. Uh, so we started that rule probably on uh, yeah, October 2022, and uh, we still have results today. So that's kind of helpful as well for detection, uh, since we don't rely only on uh, system rules and uh, correlation rules and stuff like that. And so it's always great to have uh, a safety net. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, kind of our pipeline uh, to uh, to build our rules and but to also improve them and make sure uh, there's no regression. And so, um, as you can see, we have different Tiara rules that allows us to retrieve uh, different samples. Then uh, they are all pushed to Fame, which is an open source tool by Société Générale, and um, and then uh, it kind of goes into some sandboxes. And uh, the sandboxes uh, allow us to test our rules. And uh, if it triggers a rule, it's cool. Uh, if it's not, we are looking uh, w into it and why it didn't trigger the rule. Uh, should the rule need uh, to be updated or stuff like that. And in the end, it's kind of the same for the trackers I just told you about. Uh, so, if we don't have the C2, uh, is there a new, uh, like, uh, census uh, query or stuff like that to, to make or not? So, it's kind of a, a virtuous circle, if, it's, if that's the word in English. Uh, so, uh, to improve our detection process. However, we try to automate it uh, a lot, but uh, for the sandbox, pa sandbox part, it's quite hard because uh, as you can see, sometimes they require the, a password to extract the, the zip archive and stuff like that. So it's not always easy to fully automate uh, this process. And uh, this is why uh, Erwin said we cried uh, also to make this research because it took, took us a uh, lot of time uh, and still takes a uh, lot of time today. And so we wanted to conclude our presentation by a classic pyramid of pain, but a kind of applied to uh, this research. Uh, so the first thing I uh, wanted to re remind you, <laughs> and it also reminds us as well, uh, attackers are not dumb. Uh, there's no such thing as a magic rule, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, it's kind of hard to build a really 
we thought it would be easier to be the good creation rule uh, without too much effort, but it does require some effort. And um, so to sum up, uh, everything that's related like to delivery infrastru infrastructure, like email addresses that's been used for sending phishing email, etc., it's trivial to change for the attackers, and it's kind of easy to get uh, as well for us uh, defenders. However, uh, the higher we go on the pyramid, the harder it is uh, for us defenders, but the more challenging it is for attackers as well to uh, rebuild uh, all their infection chains. So with uh, the correlation rule we showed you, we think that they are kind of good rules because it's kind of focused on root infection chains instead of just one step of the infection chain. So it kind of detects several different infection chains in the end. Uh, but it's not a magic rule, and the best will be, as I said, like detecting the whole DLL execution, DLL loading, TTPs, or stuff like that. But it's kind of really hard to do for us defenders without having too much false positives. So, uh, yeah, that's the end of our talk. Thank you uh, for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions. Some time for questions. You, you have a question. Thank you for the presentation. I uh, had a, a, a question on uh, slide 15. You showed some uh, run DLL 32 that uh, runs, uh, starts a DLL that is not uh, with the DLL extension. Uh, would that be uh, something we can hunt for or detect on? And did you dig in that? And if not, uh, uh, if, if so, is it uh, reliable? Uh, prone to false positive or, or not? Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, like classic sigma rules that uh, we can do to to perform detection. However, uh, if we go back to our radars, uh, it's kind of really specific as well. If they just don't use run DLL 32, uh, it's if they use like reg SVR 32 instead, as a rule won't work. So yeah. It's still good rules to to hunt to perform detections, but it's we think it's not generic enough, but also really good to have. So, yeah, <laughs> not a good uh, answer for that. <laughs> Thanks. So, Tom, you're sure you don't have a question? Thanks. For all the correlation rules, you have many steps to trigger it. So, from my experience of SIM, there are going to be memory issues to manage that on uh, large data sets. So, uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so I'm looking at our developers here. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, they, it, it's kind of, um, yeah, they do have uh, performance issues sometimes, uh, especially if uh, I'm going back on the schema. Uh, the hard thing for us would be the followed by. Uh, so if we want the exact order of the infection chain, uh, that takes lots of uh, resources. So we are trying the rule with, without that right now. Uh, and it seems to work, uh, but we have still a bit more false positives. So, uh, unfortunately, yeah. The best thing uh, we didn't really talk about uh, would be to have a normalized field and value for the usernames between email and system. And so you can build a rule around uh, a suspicious 
attachment in the email, and uh, it will allow us to uh, have really lots of uh, good uh, positives and not false positives, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of hard to perform uh, such kind of normalization right now, for us at least. Yeah. Okay, no more questions. One, two, three. Okay, thank you.